James chapter 5. Hey, first of all, can you hear me okay? Very good. Okay. So uh, it's good to be back here. We praise the Lord for the work that's going on here in the city. We, uh, in your missions conference or, or your missions month, you have both the Mitchells and then the last Sunday you have John Crocker. And uh, we just were at a conference with all the GFA missionaries, and we just really highly regard John Crocker. Um, he's a, a young man who's taken over our mission and just seems like a very sterling individual from Mexico City was their ministry. Um, if you speak Spanish, put it, put it hablar español. He can speak with you. Um, he was and a pastoral intern here. He was a pastoral intern here, as was, uh, is it Tim Richmond? Yeah. And Tim Richmond from Queens, uh, he was the, the key speaker. And he said, you know, we in Queens, he said, we have a responsibility to try to reach people. Any number of two, two million people have a chance to hear the gospel every year. That's a big challenge. I was saying to Pastor Bickle, and I think it's true. There are more people today than ever in history who have never had a verbal presentation of the gospel. You think uh, if we go back. 150 years ago, I don't know how they tell these things, but I think the population was about 1 billion. And now I think it's getting close to 9. Is that right? Or 8 anyways? 7? 7. 7. Okay. 7, 8. And, and think about what's happening with missions. Like we as a mission find it very difficult to recruit young people to do this. Um, maybe people, everyone knows the name of Jesus, the Muslims being the fastest growing religion in the world. They know the name of Jesus. People from all around the world know the name, but have they had a presentation of the gospel? I just challenge you, if it wouldn't be true that there are more people today who have never heard a presentation of the gospel than any other time in history. And that's our responsibility. You know, he said to us this, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Think about Tim Richmond. He says, I feel a personal responsibility that all two million people in Queens would have an opportunity to hear the gospel at least once every year. That's what we're doing. We, we, he feels like this. The Lord has said in front of their church, Queens, two million people, and they have a responsibility to get the gospel to them. And if you think carefully of what Jesus said, he said, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And by this we mean every human being. They, they should all have a chance to hear. How in the world are we going to do that? We seem so powerless to do it. And, and it, it really would take an amazing movement of God to do that. Well, what I want to look at, as Pastor Bickle has read to you, that Elijah was someone who got these tremendous answers to prayer. It wasn't just a question of bringing requests, but these are tremendous answers to prayer. And we tend to think like this, the four heroes, right? Moses, Elijah, Elisha, and Jesus. Tremendous, miraculous things that they did in the day of their visitation. But not today. That's how we think. You know, it, it's a, it, it, there was a time when there were giants that roamed the earth, but not today. And, and there's a, a certain truth to that. We may not be seeing those kind of answers. But what, what God is saying what the Holy Spirit, bless you, is saying through James, bless you again, is we shouldn't think that way. He says, we think like this, Elijah, a holy man of God, which he was, Elijah, a tremendous prophet who led the nation, which he did. But he says, he was a man subject to like passions as you are. And the idea here in this passage is the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or a righteous woman avails much. Elijah was just like you, he says. And, and I, I want to show you five amazing answers to prayer that Elijah had, but also that he was a man subject to light passions as we are. You'll see he was on a mountaintop experience. They, they had the, this showdown with the prophets of Baal. And then afterwards, Jezebel, when she hears about the death of the prophets of Baal, she says, tell Elijah at this time tomorrow, he'll be like one of them. And, and, and you would think, well, he would sit up and say, I trust God. Uh, you know, he brought down the fire and, and all this. No, he said he ran away. He was afraid. So, so what we want to see is, first of all, by way of introduction, 
for this great city, you really need to see answers to prayer if you're going to reach it. Yeah. We don't seem to be winning New York. There was a day when when one guy, I guess, set up a prayer meeting and only one person, he was the only one that came, the first one. Maybe one person came partway through the lunch hour. But then people started to come and there was a tremendous revival in New York itself. Something like that to reach this great city. It needs for there to be God just to do his powerful work that he promises he can do. And we're coming with the same idea. Here we are trying to reach the Muslims, and we are reaching them in some sense. But to see them turn from the darkness to the light, accept Christ, be baptized, and be discipled, we really need there to be amazing answer to prayer. So that's my challenge to you. We're coming in a way like uh, needful. You know, we need the Lord to do something special. We need someone who can pray with us and see us reach that level with the Muslims, just like you need here. You know, I we've been praying for at least five years this prayer for Bethel. Because Pastor Jim shared it with me last time. We pray that God would just give us a building that would be appropriate to our needs. Which seems like a miraculous thing for it to happen because of how valuable real estate is in New York City, right? But here's the thing. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. How many buildings do you think he owns here in New York City that if if he wanted to, he could say, here's a perfectly appropriate one for Bethel to grow into, if he would. Well, it's for us to ask in that way, and he will do. Father, I pray, give us hearts to believe. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Number one. I just want us to review some really amazing answers to prayer in the life of Elijah. So I'm admitting to you, he did, the Lord did tremendous things through him. It was not Elijah in his own strength, but God was listening to him. I, one of our guys here today said, Jeff, where are you? Joshua is my hero. Okay, listen to this. In a time of war, well, the Gibeonites who tricked Israel, and then the five kings came against them, and they, they called out to Israel, and they said, come and, you know, here we are, we're being attacked. <clears throat> and if you look at the passage, Israel could have said, look, we made a mistake, we were hoodwinked, do nothing, and the problem will be taken away. But they felt like they had made a commitment, and they came to help. The battle was fought, and if you read the text, it says that, that they were successful with the sword. They were defeating these five armies. But it says there were more that were killed by the great hailstones that the Lord was throwing down than were killed by the sword. And then and the day is coming to an end. And I've, I've thought through this passage from just before we came on furlough these last seven weeks. I would think if you were the commander that you would say a day well spent. We have this victory. Let's let's regather the troops and gather up our wounded and lick our wounds. And then maybe we'll go out tomorrow. But your hero, he says, son, stand still and moon in the valley of Agilon. Who would even think to do that? If you were a commander today, would you think to do that? How, how could you? It's really a, a, this kind of a vibrant faith that knows God in his personal way. And if, if you read the text, it says, he made this request in the sight of God. When we make these requests that are kind of difficult, we do it in private. So if we don't get an answer, we're not embarrassed. But it says, it says, Joshua, in the sight of all Israel, he said, sun stand still, and moon in the valley of Agilon, it says, and the sun stood still, and the moon stood still for, for the space of a day, so they could have their vengeance on their enemies. Amazing belief and answers. So this is, this is something that is certainly within the realm of the Bible. If you look at the, the teaching of Jesus on prayer, like we tend to try to reduce the amount of the promises. So, for instance, he says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. And everyone who seeks, finds. And to him that knocks or her that knocks, it will be opened. Tremendous promises, big promises. Okay, so what's happening in the life of Elijah? James chapter 5, verse 17. Think about this. When Jesus was in the boat, and it's 
the storm is rocking the boat. And they were so afraid. They said, oh, you know what they said? Don't you care that we're dying? Carest thou not that we perish? And he got up and he rebukes the wind. So big storm, all of a sudden, whoosh, everything's peaceful. And they said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the wave obey him? Well, that's the Lord Jesus. But what about a human being that does that? In chapter 5, verse 17, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. The message is entitled Stopping the Rain. And the first tremendous answer to prayer is he asked God to stop the rain. And for three years and six months, 36, 42 months, no rain. Which is actually a tragic thing. In a way. But God is doing something that seems tragical to try to bring the people back to reality. They're, they're going to idols. And he's their God. And they should be loving him. And they should be serving him. And so he allows this prayer. And he, he holds back the rain for Three years and a half, no rain. It, we're not going to read it, but uh, at the end of the time, just before he prays to, to bring back the rain, um, he he goes to Obadiah and he says, tell Ahab that I'm here. And Obadiah is so worried. He says, oh, you know, uh, if I tell him uh, the spirit of God will take you and carry you away, who knows where, and, and then he'll kill me. And, and I've, I've been a faithful servant of the Lord. He says, no, no, I'm going to meet with Ahab. And when Ahab says, he says, you're the one who troubled Israel. And he says, no, you and your idols is the one who's troubled Israel. So that's what you see is uh, when the nation turns away, then Elijah prays and God brings this judgment on them. All right. Now, in verse 18, chapter 5, James, uh, and he prayed again. All right. So here's the first prayer. Stop the rain. That's the title of the message. Stopping the rain. Because I'm asking you to stop the rain. Not literally the rain, although sometimes we would like that. But to get these kind of requests and answers that are valuable to the work of God. And by the way, that's how he tells it. He says, look, when you're asking anything in the kingdom, you can ask these big prayers. You know, don't be asking for the Mercedes. Don't be asking for, you know, uh, oh, Lord, you know, give me the Ferrari. Oh, those are, those are, that's a different thing. Then we're asking for ourselves. But when we're asking for the kingdom... For the word, for the salvation of souls, to see a building that will be fit to your needs, to see the Muslims come to Christ, to see New York City turn back. That's exactly the, the, the mind and the will of God. And we can ask big things. So chapter 5, verse 18, uh, he, he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth their fruits. Amazing. Just like Jesus, but it's just a man. And Jesus is not just a man. He's a man and God. But in Elijah... He's, he's like Jesus. He's commanding the rain. Stay up there. And he's bringing the rain down. Number three. You know all these. I, these aren't new to you, I don't think. I'm just refreshing them to you. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 16, uh, there, there is a widow woman. I, I'm not going to read the whole passage. I'm just going to read verse 16 when we get there. But he sees that they're, obviously, they're in this time of tremendous famine, drought. Uh, and he says to this widow woman, he says, make me a cake, please. She says, I, I don't have, I said, I've got, right now, I and my son, we're gathering two sticks to make a fire and to, and to have these cakes. And he says this, he says, we're going to eat these cakes and then we're going to die. So they're, they're down to the very last of their of their provisions. That's what you read it. That's what it says. We're, I, I'm, she's in the King James, it says, they're going to dress this this we're gonna I gather in two sticks, we're gonna dress this food, and then we're gonna die. And he he's you can see him smiling. He says, Okay, he says, but first make me a little cake and then prepare for you and your son. And he says, Because um because you're never gonna run out of oil or flour. Yeah, so this is first Kings chapter 17. So at verse 14, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall a cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. The barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. It's her very last bit of food. 
very last bit of oil. I'm going to dress a cake. My son and I are going to eat it, and then we're going to die. He said, okay, but first make me a cake, and then make one for your son because your, your meal and your oil is going to stay, and they stayed the whole time. A miraculous provision of food. He, it didn't seem like he was concerned about it, like, will God hear me? He told her, this will happen. He knew God. He knew the answers. He like, like here, Joshua. He, he doesn't seem to be, you know, if God wills, stop the sun or the moon. He said, the Lord knows who I am, and this is God's work, and I'm asking, and I know he's going to answer. And he says to her, look, you're not going to run out. Your meal is going to be there, and your oil is going to be there till the end of this famine. And it says, and the, the, the barrel did not fail the whole time. Amazing answers to prayer. Number four, in the same chapter, chapter 17, we come down. So it's just this woman and her son. And he, he, um, verse 17, it came to pass over these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house fell sick and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left him. He died. And she says, oh, what, did you come here to call my sins to remembrance? Everyone is a sinner. And here it is. She's done this good deed, and now her son dies. And in verse 22, it says, uh, the Lord heard the, uh, sorry, verse 21, he stretched himself upon the child three times. He cried unto the Lord and said, oh, Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. Bringing someone back to life. Amazing answers to prayer. One, two, three, four, five. First Kings 18. We can't read the whole passage. Obviously, you could do. You could spend a whole service looking at this. But in verse 37 of this passage, it says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their heart back again when the fire of the Lord fell and consume the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and lick up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. When he was preparing this, he prepared a sacrifice and put no fire on. That's what it says. And those guys, uh, the prophets of Baal, they're, they're calling out, Oh, Baal, hear us. And he's making fun of me. He says, oh, maybe he's gone on a journey. Maybe he's doing something. Maybe you should talk louder. You know, get on the phone and talk to him kind of a thing. And uh, and they become so upset about it. They're, it says that they, they dance up. I'm not going to dance up on the altar, but they stand up and they're dancing on the table. And they're cutting themselves. So they think, well, if the blood flows, he'll hear us. And they go on all day. And he says, then Joshua says, hey, come unto me. Put, put the sacrifice on the wood. And then he says, Pour four barrels of water on top of it. Four barrels of water. Why is he putting water? Is that how you start a fire? No, because if you've ever been where your wood is wet and, and you need it, it's a terrible way to live out the winter. Uh, you want your wood to be dry, but he wants it to be wet. He says, now pour on four more. Totally soaked now. He says, now pour on four more. Twelve barrels of water. And then he calls out and he said, show who is God. And it says not only is the sacrifice burned up, but the, the wood and the stones and the and the, the everything burnt up to show what God can do. And the passage is saying to us, you think he's somehow different than you. But he says, he's a man of like passions as you are, not different. In a way, the Lord is saying to us, Yes, it's amazing what has been done here in the life of this man. But you should be thinking, that's my God. And I have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. And if I can get my voice through, it does say this. I think it's in verse, um, it's in the verse I don't have here, 17, 18, uh, That the Lord heard his voice. It's actually in the passage before. You're, you're crying out for something amazing. Does he hear you? Well, he heard Elijah. He's the same God. He's your Savior if you're born again. And he makes these promises to you if he hears your voice. 
in uh, in the Russian church here just before. Uh, I wasn't sure how it would go, so uh, I I told them a little bit of I, I gave them a greeting in Russian and a greeting in Ukrainian because we have um, some Ukrainian people in our church just to know the greeting and then um, told them a little bit, took questions. There was a bit of time after we went to John chapter fourteen. He says, "Whatever you ask in prayer." Believing, you will receive that the Father may be glorified in the Son. When you look at those promises, they're not saying, "Hey, you're shut out from that." That was those guys, but you know, you're just an average person. Don't look for that. It's exactly the opposite. He seems to say, "Look, you're just like Elijah. You have the same right to ask the same thing as what Elijah said." Why? Because he's a man of like passions as you are. Two, the fault is not because the heroes aren't with us anymore. You know, the days of the giants. And, and there is a truth to that. You know, we, we think, oh, if I had been there in the days of Jesus. Well, those were wonderful and amazing days. There's no doubt about that. That's why people go to Israel. They want to walk where Jesus walked and so on. But remember this. When, when doubting Thomas says, look, when I put my finger in the hole in his hand, I will put my hand in his side, then I'll believe. And Jesus says, look, go ahead. Put your finger in the hand and put your hand in my side and believe. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And he says, you only believe in because you see. But blessed, happy are those who believe who haven't seen. You don't live in the day of giants. But he's saying that's not what matters. Uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And Elijah was a man subject to like passions as you are. The, the, the whole gist of what James is saying is, you should be looking for this. And, and I'm telling you, I need to look for this. I'm not up here saying I've achieved this. And you, I'm admitting to you, this is what we need to see in England. It's a challenge to myself. Somebody asked me, or what lady came in. I, I, honestly, I don't remember which lady it was. She said, I'm really looking forward to the message. I said, so am I. Because <laughs> I've not <laughs> preached this before. And you never know exactly how it's going to go. But, but this is the thing. It's because it's something really for me. And Debbie, like, we need this as much as you. We're not saying, hey, you know, oh, we've achieved everything in England. And, oh, wow, we have this massive revival among the Muslims. And we're coming to share that with you. No, no, no. We're exactly the opposite. We're, I'm saying this to you. You know, when they say one finger pointing at you and four pointing back at me or something. Uh, this is something that we really need. It's not that we don't live in the day of giants. That's not the point. He says, he was a man subject to like passions as you are. And yet he prayed this way, and God answered in this powerful way. So he was a man subject to like passion or weaknesses. I just want to look at those with you. If you look in 1 Kings, you might still be there, chapter 19. So we looked already at the tremendous answer to prayer. He says, send the fire down. The fire comes, it burns up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the water, the dust, everything. Then Elijah says, take the prophets of Baal and slay them here. And they slay them there by the river. And in chapter 19, verse 1, Ahab told Jezebel, his wife, all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. All right, here's Jezebel's word. Then Jezebel <coughs> sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also. I make not your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So it's a threat. And you think, look, Elijah, he just had this tremendous victory. He'll say, God will protect me. And, and you think that's what he would say. But, but what James is saying is, look, you're thinking of Elijah as though he's somehow not like you, but he is like you. And in verse 3, it says this. And when he saw that, in other words, when he heard that is the idea, or when he saw the threat, uh, when he saw that, uh, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Afraid. Motivated by fear. Though he were such a great man of God, but motivated by fear. You know, if we were counseling, we'd say, hey, stand up and God will protect you. And even if he doesn't, then you, you know, you go down in a blaze of glory, not in fear. But God is, is saying this is something that happened in reality. He ran away, and James comes back and says to us, look, this guy was like you, you know, motivated by fear, not giving out the word like you should maybe. 
because you don't want to be thought of that way. And all he's saying to you is, look, that's exactly how Elijah was. No different. Motivated by fear. He was in despair. The next verse, verse 4. He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and sat under a juniper tree, and he requested in himself that he might die. And he said, it is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life. I'm not better than my father's. He was in despair. This is, this is like suicidal. You know, he, he wants his life to be taken away. So despairing. You know, this is the thing about mountaintops is we live in the valleys. And when the mountaintops come, then the valleys will come afterwards. And how do we respond? And he responded by saying, I am not better than my father's. Take away my life. Let me go. I've served my time. I'm ready to go. Despair. Better to go. Number three, he was deceived. First Kings 19, he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord my God uh, of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, <clears throat> thrown down your altars, and slain your prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left. There's a, there's a deception. I'm the only one standing for you. He was deceived. He wasn't the only one. In, uh, in verse 18, chapter 19, Verse 18. So he tells him uh, all he's going to do. Uh, return the way of the wilderness. Anoint Hazel king. Verse 15. Uh, and Elisha the son of Shepha, or Jehu in verse 16. Uh, the head of Israel and Elisha to be prophet in your room. Uh, and, and 17. Here's what's going to happen. And yet verse 18. And yet I have left see 7,000 in Israel. All the knees which have not bowed unto Baal and the mouths which have not kissed him. He was deceived. He said, I'm the only one. He said, no, no. He says, look, you don't know, but I have 7,000 left that have not bowed the knee to Baal and kissed him. But he was overcome by these doubts and fears and despair. And I only say that, I'm not trying to say anything less about the man. The, the saying is this. He was a man subject to like passions as you. And what James is trying to say is the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. You can be that person. And I can be that person. We, we just need to enter into that same relationship that he had. And people have done that, by the way. You know, uh, Whitfield, British guy, but he came to America. Everywhere he preached... Thousands and thousands of people came to hear him. The, the guy said, he said, he said, he said I'm going to write down the words. I'm going to take down the dictation of your sermon. And he said, you'll get the words, but you won't get the thunder and lightning. He, he was, they stayed. I think both he and Wesley tried to stay or did stay a part of the Church of England. But the Church of England refused them the chapels. He, they went to Bristol or he went to Bristol, not Wesley, Whitfield. And they said, the churches here are closed to you. If you want to preach, go to the coal miners because they figured the coal miners wouldn't listen. And so he stood out and the coal miners came out, you know, their face covered in coal dust. And he's preaching and he says, you could just see the rivers running down their faces where their black faces uh, were, where the water was washing away the coal dust uh, because they were weeping at the preaching of Whitfield. Amazing things. Amazing things are possible. So it's not only the men in the Bible. There have been men in history who have been able to move the mountain. Here's what Jesus said. If you have, do you bring a mustard seed around? No. Okay. Well, I, I've never seen the mustard seed, but they say it's like a piece of uh, piece of flour. Like I, You can't hardly see the grains of flour. They said that's what a mustard seed is like. Jesus said, if you have faith, like a grain of mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, be removed. And place in the midst of the sea, and it will obey you. He's laying these promises in front of us, not, not to say, hey, you're shut out. No, exactly the opposite, that we should aspire. And, and with Elijah, we've seen the tremendous answers to promises, and we've seen that he was a man subject to like passions, afraid, yeah. despair. Let me let me die. It's enough for me to die. I fulfilled my mission here. And, and God says, Look, he said, uh, do some anointing for me. Anoint the king of Syria. Anoint the king of Israel. Anoint Elisha in your room. But listen to me. I've got 7,000 that have not bowed the knee. Just like us. And, and James is saying, look, 
you should aspire to be someone who is fervent and effectual in your prayer. All right. Well, let's look at his life of prayer. And again, so am I saying to you, uh, this is what you need, and I don't need it. No, I said this is what I need. This is what we all need if we're going to see these kind of answers to prayer. One, James chapter 5 again. This is actually not in the passage about Elijah, but it really refers to something that Elijah did. In verse 15, it says, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And this is what we see where the, where the boy was dead. And he, he, he fell on top of him and prayed for him three times. And he came back to life. Prayer of faith. In other words, we can pray, but do we believe? You're asking for hard things. Can you believe for it? Uh, you know, we were talking about answers to prayer. And we were, uh, we were with this church in Maine. And the pastor had just been diagnosed with cancer. And he, he had, on a Wednesday, he found out he had cancer and we came on a Saturday. So it had been three days later and he had, he had told first his wife and then his family and then people in the church. And then he put out email to the church family. So most everybody knew, but if, if you're a person in the church who doesn't do email or whatever, then he announced it Sunday morning and we were with them morning and evening. And after the service, it was just Debbie and I and Keith. And he was saying, I'm, I'm asking the Lord to give me complete healing. He said, can I do that? You know, will God hear me? And I said, I I didn't give him a full assurance. I said, you know, it's not like microwave popcorn. I said, it, it, it takes a certain kind of life, but he, he, he does, and he can do. And then he thought back, and you know, his dad, Stuart, who's passed away, um, he grew up always without glasses, but in his wedding pictures, he had glasses on. So he, when he was a, a grown man, he, he just realized there was something unusual about that. And he asked his dad about it. He said, well, when I was younger, I wore glasses, and then I got uh, something flew up into my eye, and the doctor said, you know, you'll never be healed in your eye. You won't be able to see out of that eye. And he was laying on the couch at Bob Jones University. It, 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 they, they lived in this mobile, what we call a uh, mobile home park. Is that right? Mm -hmm. What do we call it? Static caravans in England. So a mobile in a mobile home park, and there are a bunch of guys from Bob Jones University that lived there. And he couldn't sleep because of the pain. And he asked his wife, he said, Alice, call the men. In other words, there were four or five friends in the park who were Christian men studying for the ministry. He said, call the men and have them pray over me. The men came. They laid their hands on him. They prayed for an hour. He was completely healed. Not only was he not blind, but he didn't need to wear glasses anymore. Does God do it all the time? No. But he does do it sometimes. <clears throat> Can we be that person that prays through that way? Well, here, only thing I want to say about that from this passage is you're not shut out because you're not Elijah. He's just like you, same kind of person. You know, you put your, your as we say, you put your pants, trousers, we say in England, uh, one leg at a time, just like Elijah. Oh, he probably wore an Eastern garb. He probably didn't even wear trousers. But, you know, same kind. It's as subject to like passions as you are. And then he prayed and these things happened. So the prayer of faith shall save the sick. That's the first. So five characteristics of this prayer. I'm laying them out before you, and I'm taking notes myself, but this is what I need to be. If you want to see, you know, here we are. At least how many years have we been praying for the building? At least five. Yeah. More? Yeah. Plus 20. Okay, 25 years. Do we have the building yet? No. Does that mean God doesn't own a building in Brooklyn? No. I bet he has a handful of them. He's just waiting. What's he waiting for? Prayer of faith or something. I honestly believe there's a building here. When I pray about this, I think, you know what? He's definitely got a building there. He's got lots of buildings. He's got a cattle on a thousand hills. It's not that. I don't know what it is. I'm expecting him to give you a building at some point. That's what I believe. Like, if I didn't think so, like there, there are families in our church, when we had COVID, there were... We had three deacons. Two of the deacons exited the church and brought the their mom and another family with them because they didn't believe we should do it by Zoom, they, that we should continue to be in person. Whatever you think about that. I'm not here to argue with you about COVID, but we, we had this terrible time as a church. Why am I saying this? Uh, because I was praying for all those families to come back, and one of them did come back. 
And then the other ones did it. And you know, I just felt like, you know, the Lord sort of closed the door. And I, I still pray for them. I pray the Lord would bless them somewhere else. Or if they come back, fine. But I'm not praying for them to come back anymore. I just like the Lord closed the door. I never felt bad about this church and the building. I, you know what? I, I'm praying. I mean, I believe he, he could do it or he's going to do it. It's not a closed door. 25 years. But in, in my mind, not a closed door. I, I have to expect sometimes that, you know, we'll get a prayer letter and they say, by the way, God graciously gave us this, you know, $17 million building free. <laughs> Some guy said, oh, you know, the work you're doing with the Russians or with the Jews or with the people in Brooklyn. And we just we believe in that. I don't know. I'm not I, I don't have assurance. It's not like that. But I believe in it. If, if it wouldn't, it would be like Metin and Steve. I don't pray for them to come back anymore. And, and uh, Myrtle, those three. One lady left. I never prayed for her to come back. I thought well, there's one good thing that came out of it. But uh, but this other family, I was praying for them, and when they came back, I was like, amazing, uh, lovely family. So I believe in it. Here again, uh, he's in James chapter five. He talks about the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. This word effectual fervent is the word energy. It's a variation on the word. I know the Greek word is the word like energy. In other words, you're praying and you're giving your energy to this. You're making it a priority, putting it first. Like a lot of times prayer can be an add-on thing, but that's not what he's talking about. He says, he says, fervent, uh, the, the fervent effectual prayer. That word is the word energy. Energetic prayer. Put your put your your heart and soul into it. Give everything you have to it. Um so it's, it's this idea of pouring forth yourself, your vital energy into the ministry of prayer. Maybe you think of it as like, oh, I do pray, but, you know, not like that. But this is the word for energy, the effectual fervent prayer, energetic prayer, or putting your vital life energy into the prayer. That's what he did. You know, it says he, he, he went to the guy and he prayed three times. He, he anoints Elisha. And you know, remember Elisha, the, the, the boy had taken a head wound and he died. And uh, the mother came to him and uh, Gehazi goes and uh, he says, everything Elisha says, everything is well. And he, she grabs uh, Elisha by the foot and uh, uh, Gehazi goes to thrust, him off, thrust her off. And he says, no, no, something's happened and God has hit it. And he tells Gehazi, I don't have a rod here, but he says, take my rod and put it on the face of the boy. Nothing happened. So he goes in himself, and it says he, he put his hands on his hands, his face on his face, and prayed. And, and, and he had to do it again and again. And then it says the boy sneezed, and he woke up. He's really putting everything into it. And that's the idea here, energy. When it says <laughs> in our King James, it says the effectual fervent prayer, that's the word energy, pouring your life spirit into it because it's important to you. Because you want to see something. The effectual fervent of a prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. So this is the idea of availing prayer. Or we used to call it prevailing prayer. Praying on until we see the answers. So here's the word availing. But we also sometimes refer to it as prevailing prayer. Praying through until we see answers. So I just want to say this. There, there's a lot of teaching or feeling in Christianity that prayer is a way of um, meditation and um, drawing close to God. And it is that. No, I'm not saying that. I, I don't mean to make fun of it in that way. But the idea is this, the idea of prevailing is answers. There's always what you see. Knock and you shall receive. Everyone who knocks receives. That always seems to be the background of the, the teaching in the New Testament and especially the teaching of Jesus. It's not just an exercise. It's, it's getting into a frame. Joshua. Sun stands still in moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stood in the valley of Ajalon for the space of a whole day. There's never been a day like it before or since where God heard the voice of a man. It wasn't just, oh, well, he was exercising himself to, you know, have communion he was looking for god to do something and god did something and that's the idea of availing it's just saying 
there, there always seems to be this idea of praying and answers. That we, we need something. We can't do it in our own strength. You, you can try, but you can't, you know, he said, without me, you can do nothing. We can't accomplish anything spiritual. It has to be through the power of the spirit. And that's the idea of availing. It's prayers and answers for earnest prayer. Elijah was a man subject to like passions we are, and he prayed earnestly. This is an unusual word. It, the word earnest prayer, it's two words for prayer. Someone has translated it, praying, he prayed. Uh, and our translators here and a lot of the other translators, they use this word earnest, double praying. He was characterized by a life of prayer. Praying, he prayed. It was a big part of what he was doing. It was his relationship with God was a vital thing. Not add on, not like a Sunday thing. It was something every day, a part of his life. Big to him. Praying, he prayed. Or, or this idea, earnest, is the way the King James have tried to characterize that expression. Other, I look through some of these New Testament translations, different ways. A lot of them follow something like this. The idea of earnestness. Big part of the life. Given to it. That relationship with God. Not an Adam, but a big part. Fifth. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings. We say 1 Kings in England. I pick up all these expressions from living in England so long. In 1 Kings 18. At verse 42. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. Uh, he says to him, you should get in a hurry because the rain's coming. Uh, and Elijah went up to the top of Camel, verse 80, 42, 1842, and he cast himself down upon the earth, and he put his face between his knees, and he, his knees, and he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. He went up and looked, and he said, there is nothing. You see that? There is nothing. Give up. Give up. No answer. No, he said, go again. And he, I went down seven times. He told him seven times, go back and check. And he put his head between his knees and he said, oh, God, bring the rain. And he says, go check. No, nothing. Okay. Oh, God, I'm not going to kneel down because you won't be able to see me. But, oh, God, send the rain. Is it there? No. Oh, God, is there rain? Send the rain. Is there rain? No. Oh, God, send the rain. Is there rain? No. I'm bowing down. I'm head between my knees. Oh, God, send the rain. Is there rain? No. Seventh time. Bows down, head between the knees. He says, oh, God, send the rain. He says, is there rain? He says, there's cloud like a, like a, a little like a part of a man's hand, I think it says. Uh, verse 43. He says, look, and he said, uh, there's nothing. Go again seven times. The seventh time he said, behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. Small cloud. And he rushes to get there before the rain comes. Persistence. 25 years. We've been 30 years. Actually, we've been 80 years in this ministry of the Muslims. Not me. I'm not that old yet. But I don't know if you guys know Bob Rutledge. Missionary to Slough and 25 years, Joseph Abraham, missionary to Birmingham, 25 years. And I went there in 94, 30 years ago, which is 25 plus 25, 50 plus 30, 80 man years. Not any one person, but 80 years to see this answer. Bring in a harvest from the Muslims. And so far, go look. Is there a harvest? No, not yet. <laughs> he didn't give up. He kept going. Until the cloud came, and then he's, he rushes to get there. Okay, so all I'm saying is this. Stop the rain. You, stop the rain. And the, and the teaching is, you can. It's not something for, you know, oh, there's some giant, you know, prayer warrior somewhere else. No, you. Here in Bethel, Bethel. Uh, you know, here's the needs. Russian ministry. Uh, Brighton. Brighton Beach? Brighton, Brighton Beach. All these Russian people, right within your reach. 
And actually, where we are here, everybody's within your reach. Like here, here's a Tim. These two million people in Queens, they're in front of me. Every year, they need to hear the gospel. And that's what he's trying to do. And here in Brooklyn, you're kind of central to all of New York City. And everybody needs to hear. Stop the rain.